So I read this book so I could more confidently talk to you about this one. Salutations fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones and I would like to use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston LaRue. Actually, Claude Rains was my first and he will always be THE Phantom as far as I'm concerned. But there have been a lot of imitators over the years. Some incredible, others somewhat less than incredible. Like Twilight some years later, Phantom of the Opera was a dark melodrama that was never necessarily meant to be high art. It was released in serial format by a newspaper called La Matin, or The Morning, and was kind of like the 1910 equivalent of a soap opera. The book, like its many adaptations, is seriously cool in some parts and seriously dumb in others. The author leads the reader to believe that Christine's last name is Daye, but it might as well be McGuffin for as important as she is to the story, compared to The Phantom, Raoul, Madame Giry, or even the opera company managers. The Phantom of the Book, also known as Eric, bears far more resemblance to the delusional skull monster from the Lon Chaney classic than he does to the subsequent versions, in which he is outrageously sympathetic, if not leading man material. When the Phantom of the Book abducts Christine, he drags her underground, throws her on the back of a horse, ferries her across an underground lake to his windowless bunker, then says, don't be afraid, Christine, you're in no danger. Could we maybe have led with that, Mr. Phantom? Eric then proceeds to be truly awful to Christine and everyone else in his sphere of influence, except Madame Giry for some reason. It takes up to page 259 into a 337 page story until we get the first hint that there is a human being deserving of pity underneath all the monstrousness. My duty is my will, and my will to let her leave. And she'll come back because she loves me. It will end in a wedding, a wedding at the Madeleine Church. Will you believe me when I tell you that my wedding mass is already written? Oh as someone who has personally written wedding marches for weddings that will never be. I felt that. As he played, he got me with that, Mr. Phantom. This is by no means the only time that LaRue uses musical allusions for the purpose of reinforcing themes, and it's kind of one of my favorite things he does. For instance, Don Juan Triumphant, an in-universe opera composed by the Phantom, is never finished in the book, despite the Phantom's feverish efforts to complete it. He alone seems to see Don Juan as a tragic figure of tremendous passion who will never be satisfied, at least not in this life, a plight with which the Phantom identifies incredibly well, and a theme that I feel gets seriously undercut in inversions like the one penned by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Here we see the finished Don Juan used by the Phantom in a dominance maneuver over Christine and the entire opera. Sorry about your little dick, friend. Lanchini's Phantom sleeps in a coffin, as does Gaston LaRue's, but LaRue also decorates the walls of the Phantom's bedchamber with sheet music containing the Dies Irae, an ancient Christ-centered dirge that to this day is used as musical shorthand for the nearness of death. And I honestly don't know if the inclusion of the Dies Irae by Gaston LaRue was supposed to be a joke. I certainly took it as one. This is the 1910 equivalent of the emo boy turning his bedroom into a shrine to Nickelback or a puddle of mud. As the opera pertains to Christine, she is more often than not singing selections from The Damnation of Faust, a story in which an innocent girl gets seduced by a questionable character and ends up suffering horribly for it, which makes this portion of the Lloyd Webber stage show slash movie really weird in context. Like, I unabashedly love the song, think of me, but in universe it's supposed to be a song from Faust, as evidenced by the dreamscape on which Christine stands, flanked by angels, downstage right. And it can't be a metaphor, as though these are not the literal words, but merely something that Christine is feeling, because Carlotta was totally going to sing this a minute ago. See, Dr. Faust's actions directly led to the ruination of this girl's life. So much so that she dies on account of it. Based on what little we know of Marguerite, when she is dead, if she sings to Faust, the words of her song should be less, Think of me. More like, I'm okay, my soul is beyond this. Or, Kiss my ass, you self-centered bastard. This is one of the many instances where, in my opinion, Andrew Lloyd Webber misunderstood the implications of the Phantom story in much the same way that Stephanie Meyer misunderstood the implications of a vampire tale. These are not romantic figures. These are predators, strategically isolating vulnerable girls with non-existent self-esteem. Like, Bella's separation from her mom and her old life is more or less voluntary, but she's still thousands of miles away from her old life and friends and at a loss to relate to her emotionally distant dad at the start of Twilight. Christine's mom died when she was quite small, her musically gifted dad had become her world, and having now lost him, she is utterly alone in the world. Not sure where else to go, and because music is pretty much all she knows, she goes to the opera and kind of sleepworks while understandably in a depressive funk. Unfortunately, before he died, Christine's father promised her that when he was gone, the angel of music would visit her. So, when a dulcet baritone voice starts whispering to her from the walls of her dressing room, she goes, Is that you, my angel of music? Of course! 
At least Edward's manipulation of Bella is a lot more upfront, I guess. Like, he's all about telling her how to eat and when to eat and when she is and is not fit to drive, which is gross and awful and I hate it. But at least Bella knows it's happening and is kind of half-heartedly able to challenge Edward's authority over her life. Christine is totally isolated emotionally and susceptible to the suggestions of a stranger who speaks sweetly to her. And by the time she figures out that her dad probably didn't send this guy, she has the undivided attention of a madman and it's going to take a neat trick to get away from him. While we're in the neighborhood, though, I do want to say something meaningful in defense of this particular movie, which I actually do love. I would totally watch this movie again for fun. It has been observed by other, more successful YouTubers than I am that Gerard Butler sings a few sour notes here and there. While I cannot presume to know what was in Gerard Butler's head when he sang these sour notes, or what was in Joel Schumacher's head when he left those in, I think it may have been a purposeful choice to let the melody slip. As though Eric is working harder to fool Christine early on, but as she sees more and more of who this guy is, his voice sounds less and less angelic to her. Meanwhile, over in Twilight Land, Edward's over here thinking his diamond-esque glimmer is a hideous deformity in Bella's alt. It's okay, baby, you're only repulsive on the inside. Yay, young love. With the stage show Phantom, unlike the book or the Lon Chaney classic, again, there is a certain kind of departure from logical thought. Like book Phantom says, don't touch my mask, and establishes this maneuver as Pandora's box. So later on, it makes sense when Christine crosses that line and the Phantom flips out. As far as we know, the stage show Phantom has said no such thing. Yet when his mask is removed, he responds thusly. Damn you! You little prime Pandora! Now Eric is convinced that Christine can never love him because she's seen how hideous he is under his mask. But I myself personally have loved on some people who were double bagger ugly because I was mad about their personalities. Do we think it is possible, sir, that Christine's reluctance to hang out with you might be less to do with your bad complexion and more to do with the fact that you just threw her across the room? Maybe. In the book, Christine kind of owns the fact that she is put off by the Phantom's appearance. And when the incredibly jealous Raoul is all, Would you love me if Eric was beautiful? Christine goes, Hmm? What? Which then, of course, leads us to Vicomte Raoul. God bless and keep him, Raoul is not the douche canoe you may have been led to believe he is in the book. He is, in fact, the douche canal barge. What a wretched little insignificant asinine young man you are, Vicomte de Chenis, he furiously told himself. Not wrong. As for Christine, she was a brazenly satanic, deceitful creature. How this little Scandinavian sprite had pulled the wool over his eyes. Shouldn't there be sacred limits to hypocrisy and deceit? And shouldn't a woman be forbidden to have the clear eyes of childhood when she had a soul of a courtesan? It would have been perfectly natural for her to say with a sigh, poor Raoul, but then she repeated, shaking her head, poor Eric. What did Eric have to do with her sighs? And why was she feeling sorry for Eric when Raoul was so miserable? Yes, Raoul, your lady love, who has not yet begun to properly grieve the death of her father, has been abducted from her workplace by a weirdo with a yellow skull where his face should be, but oh, how you have suffered! Oh, the suffering of you! So Raoul cannot help but be more lovable than his in-book incarnations. To suppress the sheer self-centered ass-hattery of book Raoul would be something of an Olympic achievement. Jacob, by comparison, is fine. He's nice. And I guess he makes up for his initial niceness by being awful in the coming books. On the other hand, if we're going for a one-to-one -one ratio with Edward, Bella, and Jacob being Eric, Christine, and Raoul, respectively, following that logic to its extreme, Alice and her mother in all their forms beat the daylights out of Meg Giri and her mother. The Giri's in the novel are not especially tight with Eric, but they have a bit of a rapport with him because they keep Box 5 tidy for him and he tips them well and they share a collective disregard for the opera management. In the Lloyd Webber version, Madame Giri rescues the Phantom from a circus and brings him to the opera as a wee phantomlet. Christine of the book is pretty young when she comes to the opera, but she is a woman grown, as opposed to the Lloyd Webber version where she is a literal child, on whom Eric immediately starts to predate. While Love Never Dies might be the worst thing to hit Broadway since menopause, the idea that there might somewhere be a parallel universe in which Eric and Meg have a history is not the weirdest logic leap that Andrew Lloyd Webber and company could have made. Given how proprietary Madame Giri is over Meg and Christine, I get the impression that a conversation was had at some point between the Madame and the Phantom along the lines of, hey, your daughter's growing up real cute. Can I make her Mrs. Opera Ghost? Can I, can I, huh? Or you could focus your gross tendencies on the girl with a tragic smile and no living relatives. Ooh, good point. And I was not expecting to hate this version of Madame Giri so hard, but look at how protective she acts toward Christine in this scene. Blonde angel. My daughter, Meg Giri. And that exceptional beauty. Christine Daillé. An orphan, you say? I think of her as a daughter also. Compared to how she all but pimps her out in this one. He is pleased with you. And then there's Miranda Richardson, who I could have sworn I liked in other movies. 
but here she is the only one dipping into an accent except for Carlotta who is likely an expensive Italian import and it makes sense for her to be a character who is an over-the-top outsider. But if you think as an actor that a good ear for accents makes you a better storyteller than the next guy or gal, you are mistaken and probably a severe distraction to the story being told. Madame Giry wouldn't be speaking in a French accent, she would be speaking French, and so would everyone else. But everyone else is trusting that if they told the story well enough, the audience will go with them on this journey to the Phantom's world. That's it. That's Acting 101 and 122. You're welcome, Miss Richardson. Despite its many issues, Twilight outclasses fandom in one very important aspect, and that is that Bella... matters? Cat only knows why she matters for as unlikable and inane as she is, but as a reader of Twilight, you can't get away from Bella's point of view. Whereas in Phantom, the Rue volleys poor Christine between awful men who are trying to dominate her for endless chapters while never giving us access to her thoughts on the matter. Like, it's honestly disturbing how these two guys swear they love her, and never seem to see her as more than an object for their personal dominion. And weirdly, I think that's something that kind of works in Phantom of the Opera's favor? Because unlike in Twilight, or Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom, the love triangle is not a source for frivolous fun or cheap drama. Christine is coveted by two bad men and in agony the whole time she's interacting with these clowns. Like, it's unpleasant to see it unfold, but it's a take on the love triangle that I don't see every day, and one that I find refreshingly honest. Because love triangles aren't frivolous fun, they are agony. The end of the assorted phantoms of the opera, like the assorted ends of Twilight, are known to be divisive among fans. Lon Chaney's ending is disappointing less because the phantom dies at the hands of an angry mob, but because he dies having not learned anything. The book ends a lot like the Lloyd Webber musical, up until about here where the Phantom rethinks what love is, decides that he was out of line, and lets his captives go. I even really like that she kisses him twice. Like, no, really, the first time was not a mistake. But then there's this. A stupid, childish tantrum, undoing any lovely growth that we had seen in this character up to this point. So, whithersoever you find yourself buffeted and blown by ill winds, be they toward Twilight, Old Guard Phantom, Phantomology Old Schumacher, or even Love Never Dies, once again, King Solomon was wrong, and there is no such thing as new when the blows no good hard as some of them try. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever I can. In the meantime, take it easy. Bless you. Bye. Like my channel, buy my crap. Do da do da. There's no time to take a nap. Oh, the do da day. Hey! In case it wasn't plain, the butler did it. <laughs>